Variety.com reports Ryan Kavanaugh accused by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme. That statement in this article, which is still published on Variety.com, is at the core of Ryan Kavanaugh's defamation lawsuit against Ethan Klein. In today's video, I'm going to go through that lawsuit, which brings up some very interesting and scary legal concepts. And I'm going to be telling you why that if you support independent YouTubers and free speech, you should be rooting for Ethan Klein. Ryan Kavanaugh is bringing this lawsuit under two separate legal theories, defamation and defamation by implication. I'm going to discuss both starting with defamation. Over the past few months, Ethan Klein has prominently displayed Variety's article about Ryan Kavanaugh in the backdrop of his YouTube set. As you can see here in Ryan Kavanaugh's lawsuit, here are screenshots of Ethan prominently displaying the Variety article. Not only is the article prominently displayed, but it has been discussed multiple times, dozens of times. I don't know if you heard that Ryan Kavanaugh, this man here, mm. was accused by his ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme. So Got that's it. interesting. Yeah. That's Ugh, the it's so going. awkward. But anyway, let me get actually into this. I believe that was reported in Variety, just for clarification. Variety, yeah. yeah. And even by Ryan Kavanaugh's own admission via his lawsuit petition, every time Ethan Klein brought up the Variety article, it was conditioned or predicated on the sense that it was published by Variety and or it was his ex-partner accusing Ryan Kavanaugh of running a Ponzi scheme. You know, this petition is very long and it contains tons of examples of the alleged defamatory comments. So I'm just going to pick one, read it, and you'll kind of get the point. In July 15th, 2021 episode of Off the Rails titled, I'm sorry, Ela, Off the Rails number five, which was viewed more than 1. 1 million times, Klein said, welcome back everyone to the Ryan Kavanaugh accused by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme podcast. B, Ryan, this is one from the Variety article over here in there accused by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme, which we've now clarified was under oath. Not once did Ethan Klein and his team ever say Ryan Kavanaugh was running a Ponzi scheme. They said Ryan Kavanaugh accused by his ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme. And that's an important difference. Let's look at the California elements for defamation. One, a false and defamatory statement about another. Two, the unprivileged publication of the statement to a third party. Three, damage to the person defamed. Publication in the context of defamation does not mean it must be in print. Rather, it is considered published when it was made to a third party. Here, the most relevant element of this entire lawsuit falls on number one, element one, a false and defamatory statement about another person. I will concede to Ryan Kavanaugh that Ethan Klein is doing this on purpose. I will concede that he is talking about the Variety article over and over and over again to piss Ryan Kavanaugh off. I will concede that he is doing this out of a place of hate. I will go on the record and say Ethan Klein hates Ryan Kavanaugh. But with respect to count one, defamation, Ryan Kavanaugh cannot succeed on this claim if the underlying statement is true. So for count one, the only question that is going to matter is, is the statement Ryan Kavanaugh alleged by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme true? And here's where this case gets interesting. This Variety article only exists because Ryan Kavanaugh's ex-business partner, Elon Spar, wrote but didn't file this lawsuit against him. And in the unfiled petition, Spar alleges the following. Over time, as Kavanaugh withdrew and replaced one funding proposal after another and each one of his lies was exposed, it became apparent to Spar that Kavanaugh was operating Proxima and its related entities as essentially a Ponzi scheme using merger new investments capital to satisfy old debts, diverting corporate funds for personal use instead of paying employees and contractors, and manipulating the corporate books and records to conceal his misrepresentations. Now, if we look at this petition, you notice that every page has this huge unfiled logo on top of it, this huge unfiled watermark. What 
does that mean? I had never seen anything like that. So I'm going to play a clip from the Philip DeFranco show, which essentially lays out the situation. Hit on really well by Eric Gardner and The Hollywood Reporter, who explain a defamation case from the controversial entertainment veteran figures to explore a secret about the court system that hardly anyone knows about. I remember that Variety article that both Ethan and Ryan have mentioned? So as Gardner and The Hollywood Reporter explain, about a decade ago, an entity called Courthouse News Service began suing local court officials around the nation for not providing immediate or near-immediate online access to court filings. And adding, this service experienced some success, making the argument that the First and Fourteenth Amendment required nothing short of transparency. And as a result, the Los Angeles Superior Court system opened a media portal for reporters. But Gardner going on to explain, this is where it gets problematic, noting it takes a bit of time for court filings to be processed. Lawsuits are indexed and assigned. And for the few hours it takes for this to happen, reporters get access to what the LA Superior Court calls, quote, unfiled complaints. With the court even stamping the words unfiled on every pages of these filings. With Gardner then going on to ask and answer the question, what would happen if a lawyer submitted a complaint into the system and then came to a quick settlement before the complaint got indexed? Explaining that's what happened two years ago. Explaining that in 2017, Kavanaugh launched a new company, Proxima Media, and along with an individual named Elon Spar, he pursued a new entertainment stock exchange. But saying this then led to Kavanaugh and Spar pointing fingers at each other over funding and secrets. But then reporting within hours of submitting the complaint, Kavanaugh's rep was calling media outlets and insisting that no lawsuit had actually been filed and that news stories on the matter were defamatory. With Gardner noting, I know because I was the recipient of one of those phone calls. And reporting that Kavanaugh even put out a statement at that time accusing Variety and The Hollywood Reporter of having, quote, attempted to smear him by quoting from Spar's seeming legal filings. But then adding that Kavanaugh never did sue The Hollywood Reporter nor Variety over the stories about his tussle with Spar, and saying whether he was satisfied by the clarifications appended to the articles or cowered by the admonishment that fair reporting privilege would cover these stories, he backed off. And potentially related to that situation or now Ethan, Gardner writing that when it comes to defamation law, most states, including California, have a defense known as fair reporting privilege which basically means that anyone is free to talk about judicial and other governmental proceedings without fearing liability for repeating allegations made there. The only caveat is that the report has to be both a fair and true account of the public proceeding, and noting the media relies mightily on this privilege. And there are no so essentially, this petition was submitted for filing, but before it could be processed, the case was settled. But I don't think that matters because the allegations still exist. You can allege something without filing a lawsuit. His partner or ex-partner clearly alleged that he was running a Ponzi scheme just because the case settled before a lawsuit was initiated doesn't mean that it wasn't alleged. After all, Elon Spar, the ex-business partner, signed this complaint under penalty of perjury. That's everything in the complaint was true based on his knowledge. If I were Ethan Klein's lawyer, I would say he has three strong defenses. And actually, he has a strong offense as well. I anticipate he's going to file an anti-slap motion and go on the attack. But that is a subject for another video. I'm not going to talk about anti-slap because I would be talking for way longer. But three main defenses to Ryan Kavanaugh's argument. First, the fair reporting privilege still applies. Just because the case wasn't technically submitted or filed with the court doesn't mean that the case doesn't exist. After all, Elon Spar did file this complaint under the penalty of perjury and did submit it to the system. In the alternative, if a court finds that the fair reporting privilege technically doesn't apply because the lawsuit was not technically filed, it doesn't matter because truth is an absolute defense to defamation. If this is a real complaint actually signed by Elon Spar, then it is an allegation. It doesn't matter if the lawsuit was filed or not. In the complaint, Spar alleged that Kavanaugh was running, quote, essentially a Ponzi scheme, unquote. Full stop, if the complaint is real and Spar did allege those things, it is an accurate statement to say Ryan Kavanaugh's ex-partner accused him of running a Ponzi scheme. Again, this is different than saying, Ryan Kavanaugh was running a Ponzi scheme. And if this is the case, the person Ryan Kavanaugh needs to be upset with about this is Elon Spar for putting this allegation in the public. And my third defense is even if the Elon Spar complaint is found to be forged or fake for whatever reason, you're still suing the wrong person. It wouldn't be appropriate to sue Ethan Klein for reporting something that Variety said. This is an article which is still posted on Variety. So with all that said, I think Ethan Klein clearly prevails on the theory of defamation. So now we need to move on to the second theory of the case, defamation by implication. 
and that gets a lot more complex. California recognizes a cause of action called defamation by implication, which occurs when a defendant makes or publishes a true statement that contains a false implication. And I don't think it's going to take a rocket scientist to see that Ryan Kavanaugh's theory under this cause of action is going to be Ethan Klein's statement that Ryan Kavanaugh is accused by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme actually implies that Ryan Kavanaugh was running a Ponzi scheme. Now, what Ryan and his team are going to argue is that reporting on this allegation is defamatory because there was a settlement and Spar did retract his statement. Notably, Spar said, to my knowledge, based on information provided to me, Ryan has and is investing heavily in this business and any reference to ESX or any related business as a Ponzi scheme is not accurate. He's a visionary thinker and I wish him the best of luck in future endeavors. He and I have no remaining disputes. And Mr. Kavanaugh and his lawyers are even arguing that, saying that part of Ethan's defamatory conduct was disregarding Variety's retraction in which the original source of the accusations about Mr. Kavanaugh, Mr. Kavanaugh's former business partner, expressly disavowed them, which leads to the following issue. Does Ethan Klein have a duty to retract his statement? And I would argue, no. I would say Elon Spar's retraction doesn't mean anything. Oftentimes, when parties settle a case, they issue some sort of feel-good statement. And sometimes it's even a condition of the settlement that the parties must make a public statement saying the other party did nothing wrong in order to save face. And just because a retraction was made does not mean that the underlying allegation just magically ceases to exist. And even if the ex-business partner did retract that statement, it still doesn't mean that he never alleged it in the first place. This is where we blur the line between free speech and opinion, and this argument is what terrifies me. As you can see here, in order to prevail on this defamation by implication or false light theory, a plaintiff must show that the defendant implied something that is false. Here, the implied statement is Ryan Kavanaugh accused by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme. Essentially, the false statement is Ryan Kavanaugh was in a Ponzi scheme. And while truth is an absolute defense to this argument as well, now the theory has shifted because we have implied the action. So it's no longer a defense just to say, well, his ex-partner accused him of running a Ponzi scheme because the argument is one step above that. The argument is, Ethan is implying that Ryan Kavanaugh did run a Ponzi scheme. So in order to prevail on a defense of truth in this situation, Ethan would have to actually prove that Ryan Kavanaugh was running a Ponzi scheme, which is near impossible to do. Additionally, to prevail on this theory, Ryan Kavanaugh will have to show that the comments were offensive, which I don't think he'll have any trouble doing. Identification of the plaintiff, I don't think. Ryan Kavanaugh will have any trouble with that. Public disclosure, he won't have any trouble with that as well. Fault, a plaintiff must also show that false implication occurred due to the defendant's fault. If the plaintiff is a public figure, which I think Ryan Kavanaugh is, then the plaintiff must show that the defendant acted with actual malice. And again, and essentially this is what makes this case so scary. This case is going to come down to whether or not a court finds that Ethan's statements were either opinion or parody. If they find that it wasn't opinion or it wasn't parody, then he will be found liable for the defamation by implication theory under this case. Even though everything he said was technically true. So now essentially this whole case is going to hinge on what is included in your First Amendment right to free speech? And inside of that First Amendment right, what is included in your right to criticize others and voice your opinion? And this is why I'm so passionate about this case, because it could very well set the wrong precedent. A couple of things that I want to point out is the U.S. Constitution will protect the use of hyperbole and extreme statements when it is clear that they are rhetorical ploys. I don't think that it is by any stretch of the imagination to classify Ethan Klein's statements as a rhetorical ploy, even an extreme rhetorical ploy. He is saying over and over and over again that Ryan Kavanaugh accused by ex-partner of running a Ponzi scheme. But in order to determine whether or not this is simply opinion or 
false light or a implied defamation, the court will need to distinguish between what is being said as fact and what is being said as opinion. And in doing so, the court will need to determine what the difference is. So in general, a fact statements are statements that can be proven true or false. By contrast, opinions are matters of beliefs or ideas that cannot be proven one way or the other. And in his lawsuit against Ethan Klein, Ryan Kavanaugh and his team are alleging statements that could very well have different outcomes under this analysis. For example, quote, wow, shady as f That is clearly an opinion in my opinion. But the statement, here he is, Ponzi scheme. I first read he run a Ponzi scheme in Variety by his ex-partner. Yeah, here it is, Ryan Kavanaugh. That statement could be a fact, meaning it could be disproved. So what is a court going to do when it's this weird toss-up type of situation? Well, they're also going to look at the context and the totality of the circumstance. Luckily, I think this part of the analysis weighs heavily in favor of Ethan Klein. In general, courts will look at the context and medium in which the alleged defamation occurred. The H3H3 podcast is a podcast that centers around an internet personality, Ethan Klein. It is not pretending to be the news. It is not pretending to be unbiased. They're not pretending to be journalist. It is Ethan Klein expressing his opinion time after time after time. And if you take those statements in context with his show and his plot lines, I think it is clear as day that this is simply opinion and he cannot be found liable for defamation by implication. At least that's how I see it. The scary thing is that a court might not see it that way. Which brings us to the ultimate question. Why is this case important and why you should care about it? Powerful individuals and entities sue their critics all the time. It is an unfortunate reality of our legal system, especially when there is a prima facie case for defamation that occurred. When the case hinges on an affirmative defense, such as opinion or privilege, most of the time the defendants in these types of lawsuits end up just caving, retracting their statements or settling because it is much cheaper. And when you find somebody who is willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars fighting for their right to free speech, it is important that they set a strong precedent for the rest of us to deter actions like this from happening in the future. We cannot set a precedent where content creators can get sued for defamation for simply reacting to the news. Even if they are purposely reacting to a news story that is embarrassing to somebody else because that creates a slippery slope. Could I get sued for talking about Ryan Kavanaugh's lawsuit against Ethan Klein because Ethan Klein is talking about an alleged statement that is defamatory? And perhaps the scariest and most concerning thing about this entire lawsuit, beyond the actual allegations of defamation, is that Ryan Kavanaugh and his team have a damage model in which they're trying to hold Ethan responsible for the actions of individuals who consume his content. Now, I have said before on this channel that I can foresee a situation in which that is applicable. And I said in a past video, when the creator is expressly telling their community to do something tortious to the alleged victim, and I'm very careful with my words, I say tortious, not harmful. And I say that because Ethan Klein has been directing his followers to does Ryan Kavanaugh look like Harvey Weinstein.com. This could potentially be deemed as harmful, but is it tortious? Is this embarrassing for Ryan Kavanaugh? Almost certainly yes, but is it a tort? Is it tortious? And I would argue no. Because having internet beef with somebody is probably your First Amendment right. So long as you don't pass that line of committing defamation or another tort. And having an opinion that somebody looks like somebody else as silly or realistic or unrealistic as it is, is just an opinion. And we need to protect opinions. An example I like to give of a potential action in which I think the creator could be held liable for the actions of their community is doxing. If I doxed Ethan Klein and said, Ethan Klein lives at 123 Smith Street and Ethan Klein is later swatted 
or somebody breaks into his home and injures him or his family, I think my actions were so negligent and it was so foreseeable and it was unprotected speech that I could very well be held liable. But that is clearly not the case here. Setting a precedent in which content creators are afraid to speak out about anything because some crazy person on the internet is going to say something stupid. Look at this tweet they included in their lawsuit. Defending a genocide ethos state. Cringiest thing you've done since allegedly running a Ponzi scheme. This has two likes and one retweet. Ryan Kavanaugh, this is 2021. I'm an apolitical lawyer on YouTube. You should read my comments. I get roasted all the time. And whether you like Ethan Klein or not, if you support YouTube and independent content creators, you should support him during this case because it is going to create precedent one way or the other. And I just hope it's precedent that supports free speech and independent content creators. And in the interest of transparency and keeping an open mind, I'm extending an open invitation to Ryan Kavanaugh and any member of his legal team to come on my show, have a discussion about this case, and educate me as to why y'all think I'm wrong. All right, y'all, that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. My goal is always to make content worthy of your time. Talk to you later. Bye. He's a catastrophic injury attorney who accidentally became a YouTuber, Attorney Tom.